Good day, Stardust. My name is Stephanie and I have a passion for tarot cards. In today's video, I'm going to be highlighting the beautiful life of Pamela Coleman Smith. I really wanted to do a video on her life, her um, contributions to humanity, and her beautiful spirit. I love the Rider Waite Smith Tarot deck. I've been working with that tarot deck since I was 16 years old and I'm currently uh, practicing as a tarot card reader. And I absolutely love her illustrated uh, tarot cards in that deck. I think they're beautifully designed in the Arcana, Arcana and Minor Arcana. Also, I find her um, artistic um, designs to be inspirational and filled with passion and beautiful insights into other um, heavenly realms. Um, and she was such an interesting person and personality. And I really wanted to do a vi video um, highlighting the historical events and moments of her life. Although because I am a psychic medium and in intuitive empath, I naturally tuned into the energies and the echoes of the life of Pamela Coleman Smith and she did come through to me uh, in spirit and really relate to me um, a couple of insights about um, her core values, um, her life and some uh, messages that she would like relayed to people who are interested in her in modern times. So I am going to be um, channeling a couple of um, psychic mediumship insights um, from Pamela's spirit um, throughout this um, historical summary of her life. And I just want to say that with any um, psychic intuitive uh, mediumship work, I encourage the audience to use their discernment and that the information that's relayed is my own personal perception of the truth. It's not absolute and it's for general information purposes only. Uh, so please use the sermon critical thinking and uh, always follow what resonates with you. Um, I aim to honor um, her memory and um, to make this a memorial of her life's work and uh, her true um, spiritual and um, soul's message and energetic signature that is so strong it has lasted throughout all of these um, years and will continue and also I wanted to um, shed some light um, because she really would like someone to demystify a couple of perceptions about her um, that may be controversial or may be um, not approved or um, or just jumping on the bandwagon of what the spiritual community has made her out to be. Um, she feels that her ego personality has been um, inflamed and exaggerated um, throughout certain aspects of her avatar um, as Pamela Coleman Smith, um, the iconic character that we remember uh, is not a true representation of who she was as a regular um, uh, human being. And I was a little reluctant because I don't aim to be controversial. I don't aim to have debates and to um, dishonor other people's perceptions of her in the spiritual community. However, um, <laughs> I am one voice in a sea of many voices and um, she would always speak her mind and speak her truth. So she has encouraged me to do so. And I'm very honored to have uh, connected with her spirit. And I hope that this video shed some light, uh, in, uh, some insights into her life and her art and her wisdom um, that will literally um, stand out throughout all of the ages ahead. So. Without further ado, let's get into it. <laughs> P 
Pamela Coleman Smith was born in Pimlico, London, England on February 16th of 1878. Her astrological sign was Aquarius. Okay, so what we know about Aquarians, they are intuitive, they are artistic, they are innovators, they are leaders, they love being the center of attention, a little rebellious, very clever, very sneaky. Um, although social and humorous, at times, at other times, they can be kind of distant and withdrawn and almost apathetic with others. So it's really interesting that she was uh, an Aquarius in her time because in the 1800s, um, proper Victorian ladies pretty much had a structure and a predestined uh, life path. However, Pamela did not follow traditional Victorian uh, female roles of her day. So she was groundbreaking. She was rebellious. She was innovative. She walked her own path. But she couldn't have done that without the help of her parents. And this is what I wanted to highlight. Her parents actually were in their own right um, uh, thinking outside the box. They were also uh, rebellious. They didn't always follow um, proper social norms. Um, they loved to travel and have adventure and they were both very interested in music and theater and the arts and that core essence of curiosity, imagination, artistry, uh, drama, and the joie de vivre really was stemmed from that passion from her mother and her father. And not a lot of people take the time to think that. So I really wanted to say that, like as she's, you know, whispering in my ear, she's like, yeah, my parents were not your typical parents. I mean, yes, they did follow certain social norms of getting married um, and being part of a, a religious church. And I'll get into their um, actual faith in a little bit. But they were nomadic. They loved to not be in the same place all the time. They loved being social with people, communication, um, hard work, um, a hard work ethic uh, stems from her father. And then her mother was very creative in dressmaking, in sewing. And in her own right, her mother was very theatrical and did star in a couple of theatric plays. And there are some um, researched uh, historians that can prove that, you know, she probably did do that as per a couple of references. So Pamela is saying that, you know, she is the product of her mother and father. And because she was an only child, she could be the center of their world, the center of attention. And they really did cater to her needs. And they were from a middle class family. Um, now we're talking about the time of when Pamela's mother and father got married and when they had her, they were in the middle class. So they were financially stable. There's some financial things that happened kind of later on. But at that time in her childhood and early, early adolescence, um, she did live quite comfortably. Um, and that's because her father uh, worked at several different jobs um, in, in different places and was always making a proper income. And her mother was very active in social activities uh, with the community and she would actually do things on the side. So there was a barter system that was happening in their home inter like interiorly with her mom. So her mom was doing like a side hustle <laughs> um, in her day, either um, not so much with cooking, but a lot to do with um, clothes and crafts. Um, I, I see her doing a lot of that. So that's where Pamela learned how to sew, how to uh, draw, how to create a lot of different things. So there was a lot of creative process and music was a 
big part of their family dynamic. They loved listening to music. So we have a very um, artistic, imaginary, um, adventurous uh, family dynamic, um, which is not typical in the 1800s. It's just not a typical uh, life. Uh, path for most people. So keep that in mind that a lot of her amazing quirks and um, uh, personality traits uh, do stem from, from that, from her parents. Because Pamela drew the tarot cards, I asked her if she would tell me which card represented her in different aspects of her family and life um, to kind of tell the story and pictures through her, her amazing tarot cards. And she uh, picked these cards, I didn't. So Pamela um, saw herself as a page of cups. So she really did see herself as the page of cups um, as a child, as a teen, and in her early 20s. And that's because um, she was filled with um, emotions. Her senses were hyperactive. She was um, a hyperactive, hyper alert, um, very uh, in tuned uh, to source as well as to the natural world. And what I mean by that is to nature, to colors, especially to the five senses. So we have a lot of water energy coming from her. And what I mean by the five senses is that um, she did um, feel, touch, see, hear differently than other people. And she was able to um, be very intuitive in that nature, which was great because all of the um, divinely inspired fantasies and imagination that she was able to project um, came out in all of her artistic works um, from costume design to her written work to her artistry uh, to her uh, theatrics um, she she uh, was able to divinely download these amazing muses of inspiration from heavenly realms so that's what she <laughs> says to me and um, yeah she really uh, saw herself as the page of cups and as for her mother, her mother, she says, represents the Queen of Cups. And that's because her mother um, had a very similar emotional sensory. Um, she was very emotional. She could feel a lot, of, a lot of things. And she was very intuitive. And um, she almost had... Uh, a, perhaps a little bit too much emotional, like her, her mother was more emotional uh, than herself. So as we see with the Queen of Cups, you know, she's looking at uh, the chalice, um, you know, she's able to focus uh, her imagination and she's able to um, get this divine gift, which is the chalice. This is just a, um, uh, a representation, a metaphor of how um, pa uh, Pamela saw her mother. She did see her mother as uh, her greatest muse, her greatest source of inspiration. And uh, she definitely sees her as the Queen of Cups. And her father is represented as the King of Pentacles. And um, that is because um, he was definitely um, interested in music especially, but he had a very industrious uh, nature to him. He uh, wanted to um, provide wealth and fortune for himself and his family. He had more structure uh, than uh, his wife and um, his daughter, uh, but he still you know, was very connected uh, with the natural world, meaning that he saw the beauty in nature and in people and in things, made him um, very charismatic, able to get work pretty much anywhere. Um, and he had this um, 
down-to-earth nature about himself. So she's telling me that he's definitely the king of pentacles. He's able to uh, rule the material world and he, he did so um, during his time on earth. However, she says that she had a little bit too much of water energy and it kind of like flowed pretty much anywhere she wanted. She had a hard time staying in one place and or following structure. He had a little bit more of that. Although she inspired to please her father, she didn't have his um, down-to-earth nature. She has, uh, Pamela has a lot of water and a lot of air energy. She is uh, very communicative, uh, very um, psychic, very uh, open, um, so it's like feeling and and speaking, so feeling and speaking, however, grounding, not so much, <laughs> not so much with the grounding. So uh, she wanted me to um, share that with everyone. Researchers of Pamela Coleman Smith have documented and mentioned that she had a very unique brain and they coin this um, mental function as um, synesthesia and synesthesia is when a person exhibits the ability to um, have the five senses uh, to experience them um, in a heightened state. So for example, when she would walk into a room that had beautiful music on, um, most of the time classical music, she could taste what that music tasted like. Or if she was painting, she could hear the music of that painting. Uh, if she uh, was looking at something, um, you know, maybe she could feel a certain emotion. So synesthesia uh, is very interesting that she could, you know, taste colors or she could hear music. Um, by painting. So all of the five senses, all of the um, visual, auditory, everything um, were mixed, intertwined with each other and she could actually bring forth um, these vibrational frequencies that would manifest as a sensation as and as i'm saying that she says it's it's like the star she doesn't know why she was born that way nor did she question why she was the way she was she knew she was unique but she didn't really consider herself to be weird or anything she just had these innate natural abilities to experience the natural world as well as the spiritual world um, interchange interchangeably. She perceived reality in what I call a higher density, um, as a higher density being. And that is metaphysical in nature. But um, definitely the star is how she describes um, herself. Uh, everything was a sensory experience, um, especially with colors. She could perceive colors from uh, angelic and higher dimensional realms um, because she was in connection with her own source, her own divinity. Um, you know, in metaphysics, this means a lot of her uh, chakras, especially her third eye and her crown, were already naturally open and she was able to receive um, these divine uh, images, but also to experience, um, you know, the 3D physical reality um, in my perception as a higher density being. Um, everything was more beautiful the texture the smells the the physical realm was heightened and the best way to describe it is to think uh imagine you know walking in the in 
walking outside and being able to see the actual energy fields and auras of the trees, of the animals, of the water, of nature, of Mother Gaia. Imagine having no filter. <laughs> she didn't have a filter, so this is why she was able to perceive these beautiful things. And she lived a lot uh, within her internal world. She tells me that she had a very um, real and internal fantasy world filled with imagination. Um, she calls it the heavenly realms of thought. So this is what she's like, heavenly realms of thought dwelled within me and I would go there and reside there and I could be everything, feel everything and see everything. And I try to show that in my art and in my expressions, um, but they didn't come close. Like they were paled comparisons to the actual art and magic and <laughs> uh, divine inspiration and passion that she could create within her own mind. Um, she can only have a certain percentage out on <laughs> on paper or out in the physical world and and that's just the way it is because um, you know living uh, in the 3d reality um, we are trying to evolve to bring more of the higher densities down um, but she really did that and that's what's so innovative and groundbreaking and um, the esoteric part of her personality and her being and her message was the ability to bring down these um, other dimensional realms which are higher vibrational realms, higher light, higher density, higher imagination, um, basically just all the star energy like just pouring down. That's It was just she was a conduit for that muse of inspiration from the divine and she just um, gave it she just gave it back to the earth so she uh, created um, flawlessly she gave of herself selfishly and she was always authentic and true she was always living out her truth um, you know throughout her life even though you know later on in her life she did experience some hardships so I just wanted to mention that um, that is a beautiful um, representation of who she was uh, as a soul as a human being um, and uh, it's something for for us who love her artwork to be inspired to create our own um, uh, creative outlets and uh, she really is an inspiration uh, to myself and to um, many more individuals out there so I'm just gonna say at this point thank you Pamela for um, bringing down the divine uh, while you were here on earth One thing that Pamela really wanted me to showcase in this video were her parents and her grandparents and a little bit about her family tree because all of the attention and the hype is uh, focused on her and um, her artwork uh, as well as the commissioned uh, tarot deck art of the Rider Waite Smith deck um, tarot. All of that energy, concentrated energy, is on that. And it is a significant part, but it's not the only part. She really wanted to pay homage to her, um, her ancestors and her family. So I wanted to do that a little bit um, by sharing some information. Um, I apologize if I'm reading. It's difficult to remember all of the dates and the names. Um, so Pamela's parents were married on September 28, 1870 in Greenberg, Winchester, New York, United States. So they were um, brought together <laughs> in the United States and she says that um, her father was infatuated with her mother before her mother was because her mother was um, uh, significantly older than her father. Um, 
historical records say she had a seven year difference in age. So she was older and he was younger and she was extremely um, humorous and flamboyant and extroverted and he really was, um, uh, he fell in love with her joie de vivre, her, um, her theatrics and um, basically her fun loving nature. So Pamela's grandfather on her father's side um, so her father again was named Charles Edward Smith and his father <laughs> was named uh, Cypress Porter Smith and he married uh, an American a woman uh, named Lydia Lewis Hooker uh, which was Pamela's grandmother and um, so her Pamela's grandfather was um, uh, into politics and he was the mayor of Brooklyn from 1839 to 1842 so this just gives you a little bit of the uh, family dynamics so again um, her ancestors were really into service to the community um, very political very uh, social, uh, very community oriented um, into social welfare, welfare. So this is the kind of like the energy behind that. So Pamela's parents were Charles Edward Smith and he married his wife, Pamela's mother. Her name was Corrine Coleman. And interesting fact, she was the sister of a famous painter, Samuel Coleman, um, which I will in a moment um, showcase some of his artistic artworks and compare it to Pamela's artistic artworks. And you can see that um, in the family lineage, um, they were very artistic and both um, wonderful artists. And you can see that it was definitely in their bloodline uh, to be artists and painters and um, creative souls. Let's take a look at Pamela Coleman Smith's family tree, shall we? We see here Pamela Coleman Smith, born the 16th of February 1878, in Pimlico, London, England. Her nationality was British. She also had a nickname called Pixie. She is known as a British artist, illustrator, writer, publisher, and occultist. She is best known for illustrating the Rider Waite tarot deck, also called the Rider Waite Smith or Waite Smith deck, for Arthur Edward Waite. Pamela died on the 18th of September, 1951 at the age of 73, in Bude, Cornwall, England. Pamela's mother was named, Corinne Coleman Smith. Corinne was born in 1834 in Boston, Massachusetts, USA. She is the daughter of Samuel Coleman Jr. and Pamela Lewis Chandler Coleman. Corinne had one sister named Pamela Atkins Coleman Howard and one brother named Samuel Coleman Jr. Her brother, Samuel Coleman, was an American painter, interior designer, and writer, and is remembered best for his paintings of the Hudson River. Samuel was one of the founders of the American Watercolor Society and served as the organization's first president. Samuel Coleman Jr. is Pamela's uncle. They shared similar artistic styles, as seen here. Corinne married Charles Edward Smith on September 28, 1870 in Irvington, Greenberg, Westchester, New York, United States. Corinne and Charles only had one daughter, Pamela Coleman Smith. The family was based in Manchester for the first decade of Pamela's life, but they moved to Jamaica when Charles Smith took a job in 1889 with the West India Improvement Company. The Smiths lived in the capital, Kingston, for several years, traveling to London and New York. Pamela's grandmother on her mother's side was Pamela Lewis Chandler Coleman. Pamela was born on June 30, 1799 in Portland, Cumberland, Massachusetts, United States. 
Her parents, making it Pamela's great-grandparents, were Joel Chandler and Pamelia Lincoln Chandler. Pamelia Lewis Chandler Coleman had one sister named Jane Chandler Pratt. Pamela's grandmother Pamelia died on November 8, 1865 at the age of 66 in Terrytown, Greenberg, Westchester, New York, United States. Pamela's grandfather on her mother's side, was Samuel Coleman Jr. He was born on April 18, 1799 in Augusta, Kennebec, Massachusetts, United States. He married Pamelia Lewis Chandler Coleman on September 2, 1824 in Portland, Cumberland, Maine, United States. Pamela's great-grandparents on her father's side were Samuel Coleman and Susanna Atkins Coleman. Samuel Coleman Jr. died on November 19, 1865 at about the age of 66 in Brooklyn, Kings, New York, United States. Pamela's father was Charles Edward Smith. He was born on May 27, 1846 in Brooklyn, Kings, New York, USA. Pamela's grandparents on her father's side were, Cyrus Porter Smith and Lydia Lewis Hooker Smith. Charles had six siblings. Charles was the husband of Corinne Coleman Smith and the father of Corinne Pamela Mary Coleman Smith, which was Pamela's full name. Charles was an American merchant from Brooklyn, New York, and the son of Brooklyn Mayor Cyrus Porter Smith. Charles was baptized in 1846 at the First Presbyterian Church in Brooklyn, New York. At the time of Pamela's birth in 1878, the Smith family was based in Manchester, England and lived there for about 10 years, they moved to Jamaica as mentioned before when Charles took a job involving the Jamaican railroad systems. They travel a lot, from the United States, to Jamaica, to England, several times. Charles passed away on December 1, 1899 in New York City at the age of 53. His death records gives his full name as Charles Edward Smith, occupation accountant. Charles passed away two years after his wife passing. Some say of a broken heart. So, the persona of Pamela Coleman Smith has traveled the world, and there's, um, as he's juggling multiple ideas and multiple facets and everyone has a reason to believe what they want to believe about Col Pamela Coleman Smith, um, either for uh, their service to self or, <laughs> or just uh, their own personal opinion. But she wants me to be a little lighthearted in what I'm about to say because in um, <laughs> in reality it is an aspect of the truth and um, but I have to say that this is um, uh, for <laughs> like supposedly and for general information <laughs> purposes only uh, as I'm saying this. Um, there, there is evidence to the contrary that Pamela Coleman Smith um, was not uh, biracial. She was not um, mixed uh, with black heritage. If you look at her recent family tree, um, they are Caucasian and they reside um, from her mother's side uh, in England and then on her father's side in America. And in the immediate family tree, um, they are all Caucasian uh, and they're white. They have features of dark hair, hazel eyes, brown hair. There's a possibility that they could have had um, olive skin or darker skin tone, um, but there is no evidence, factual evidence, that Pamela Colden Smith is a biracial um, female in her day. But that does not negate the possibility that she has in her ancestral lineage um, a multicultural or mixed races. She could very well have have um, black heritage. She could perhaps also have maybe Asian or Native American. Um, if you look at her facial features, um, it you can kind of guess, but that's just an educated guess. It doesn't mean it's actual DNA proof of where her ancestors came from. She does have a unique face. 
she is very exotic looking. She does have darker hair. She has more pronounced features. They're more, um, uh, what I mean by pronounced is that they're very dramatic features, as well as her eyes. Her eyes, I find, are very mystical. They're cat-like. They're very um, angelic and fae kind of energy to her facial features. At different points in her life, she did change um, aesthetically, like everyone does. Um, but she was, you know, medium in height, slightly petite, maybe a little bit more ro robust, but it's her larger than life personality and the traits that she chose to exhibit that created the persona and the avatar and the illusion of what the outside world perceives her today and how she was perceived in the past. So I hate to burst everyone's bubble and it's not to diminish any quality for Pamela Coleman Smith that she is not <laughs> a mixed black woman. And if she is, there's no ancestral recent evidence uh, proving that. And there are many, many articles uh, about that. I'll post another video um, that illustrates an interview um, and there's other ideas about that. So what is kind of like, uh, well, I'm just gonna be honest with her. What's bothering me is that everybody has a certain idea of who Pamela Coleman Smith and they, they cling to her avatar for social and political reasons and for mystical and personal reasons and they um, fantasize and they uh, propagate her into a larger than life persona, kind of like a diva, a goddess, a mystic. And she laughs because <laughs> she was extremely humbled. She had, she did not, she loved attention, but she didn't need the attention because of selfish reasons. She loved to make people laugh. She loved being, um, uh, uh, bringing uh, sound and motion and art into people's lives. Like she loved the the motion and the mystery of life. But people keep thinking that she is in a certain way. And she showed me her true self in this life. And she's like, I was, yes, artistic. And I was quirky and weird. But I was plain Jane, like she did not see herself as this bohemian, gypsy-like, mystic, occultist, high priestess kind of personality. These are things that were added on to her name um, in uh, recent history for uh, occult merchandise and propaganda and, uh, and whatnot. <laughs> What she wants to tell everybody is that she has the best childhood in Jamaica. She loved the culture, she loved the people, she loved the Jamaican spirit, and she loved the stories that um, she learned from the people around her. And she integrated them into her psyche, into her personality, into her mannerisms. And that just added to the allure of that um, wonderful black heritage. So in some ways she crossed over a lot of the um, uh, African and black heritage of Jamaica into the Western world um, through her art, through her books, and um, uh, through her published books, uh, which were based on the Jamaican um, folk tales of their culture and she just like her soul her nature of her soul is very caribbean very jamaican very uh you know she loved the music and everything like she just embodied that as a, as a soul but just because her physical body didn't have their dna it doesn't take away from anything so i hope that People will 
do the research themselves see for yourself and if you feel that you know that it's incorrect and that's fine um, at the end of the day she really doesn't care <laughs> what people thought she was she really just cares about um, uh, get to this channel message <laughs> jumping ahead there is actually just really one thing that she cares about and it's more about how people um, perceive the world and art and life it's less about her as a, as a person so let's continue so when she was 14 15 her family moved back to new york um, in america and at 15 pamela colbin smith um, enrolled in the uh, pratt art institute and um, arthur wesley dow who is a painter printmaker photographer and influential art educator so arthur wesley dow was the chairman of the Pratt Institute at the time and um, taught uh, Pamela Goldman Smith. And what she wants me to relay about this experience at the Pratt Institute was a couple of things. First, she's incredibly grateful for what she learned from her um, teachers. Um, she really um, finally saw that she had uh, a high stamina for uh, the arts and that she had a way with colors and um, drawing and painting that was exceptional in her discipline. She always outshined her classmates when it came to her artworks. Um, when it came to her writing, um, uh, she was a little bit more uh, carefree and uh, scatterbrained, had a lot of weird notions that were not recognized in uh, the structure of that school discipline, and she kind of wobbled a little bit uh, with that. But when it came to the theater and the arts, this is actually something that she um, truly fell in love with. And she truly loved um, working in uh, theater. But before we get to that, I wanted to let you know that Arthur Wesley Dow, um, when he taught Pamela Colton Smith as well as his other students, he made them learn Japanese block prints. So they had to take their initials and um, practice putting their initials in a Japanese character, which is a form of hieroglyph, like a J Japanese character form. <laughs> I don't think it's called hieroglyphs, but like a character form in, in the Chinese, like the way that the Chinese have their uh, characters in their uh, writing. And um, Pamela learned how to put her initials in a um, unique and specialized manner to trademark her uh, signature uh, for her artwork. So he really taught her, you know, how to be unique, how to trademark your work as an artist and how to have people recognize who you are because uh, signatures can sometimes be vague or they could mimic names from other people that are not artists. So Pamela took this very seriously and she uh, designed uh, with her initials, so, pa so P, C, S, she designed them in a specific way um, that would be, da -da -da -da, the signature that you see at the bottom um, this is her initials. This is her trademark. This is her work. Uh, every painting, every design that she ever created, um, she had that. So that is based on a Japanese character um, off of her initials, um, uh, uh, PCS as well. Uh, so it's designed in a certain way. It may not reflect the actual letters, but it's, it's in there and it uh, finishes off with a period and the period has different um, interpretations but if you look at language and they were um, studying latin at the time and the way that um, periods kind of like end sentences it is said that it means um, to complete a final thought or this is the end so it is said that pamela put a period to illustrate that um, this is who she is, Pamela Coleman Smith, 
in her artistic work. It is my complete thought and this is the end. Like, I am whole, this is it. I'm not sure if that's 100% true, but that is what they say it means. I think it's absolutely unique and beautiful and I really wanted to share that with people because maybe you never noticed these amazing little symbols that is literally everywhere in her work. So, just to show you again. Just love that. There you go. The magician. <laughs> So what were Pamela's parents' belief systems and what did Pamela believe in? So I just want to say that there's no historical evidence as to exactly what they believed in. But what is known is that they did practice sweet, sweet and borginism. which is based on the ideologies of Christianity. So when I asked her, you know, what were, what were, you know, what was it? So they did not have a church going um, kind of mentality. They really were into as a family is um, service to the community. So they were really of giving of themselves um, kind of mentality um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you now pamela coleman smith um, always had a connection to the divine um, she was always intuitive um, and that's why people call her a mystic however um, in her um, adulthood she was interested in spiritual topics um, but there's a um, misperception of who she was as uh, a mystic and occultist. But her parents, you know, believed in God and they believed in the divinity in the natural world. And they really um, wanted to live uh, good lives by doing good deeds for others. So I'm getting this again, like just very, like very giving people. Um, Pamela was still at the Pratt Institute. Her mother did pass away. And when this happened, um, this changed her world. So she wanted me to show the tower. Um, basically, she was caught off guard and it uh, everything that she knew would change from this moment on. Um, she was at the Pratt Institute, so she felt an enormous amount of guilt for not being with her mother um, when she passed. And her father was never the same after that. Um, he uh, literally passed away two years after. And they don't really talk about the cause of death, but um, she told me that the real reason was um, a broken heart. And he really um, did not want to continue living uh, without her, um, his wife. So um, this all happened um, when Pamela was now 21. That is when her uh, father passed away two years later. And now she had to um, be on her own because she was an only child. She didn't have the help or supervision from any aunts or uncles. Um, she was expected to um, take care of herself and be very independent. And um, that was okay with Pamela because um, because they had lived a nomadic life, an adventurous life, um, she was not scared to be by herself, to go places by herself, and to be independent. These are one of the great attributes um, of Pamela and um, she was definitely a feminist and um, hear me roar, roar kind of woman <laughs> in her era um, because at the time you know women uh, may have crumbled under pressure or wanting to get married so Pamela Coleman Smith did not rely on any man she did not have relationships or or get married she um, had 
um, a will and desire to just um, you know continue living her life so that's what she did moving forward but because the Pratt Institute um, had too much rules too many constraints she just couldn't follow them and this is not in any historical documents this is just what I uh, intuitively picked up on the energy is um, Pamela um, was on the spectrum she had a form of autism and this explains a lot of the erratic or odd or, or uh, quirky behaviors that she may have displayed um, throughout her lifetime and there's no way to prove that but the way that she her mannerisms or the way her brain functioned was different than uh, the people of their day in uh, mainstream society of its day so you know she does confirm that with me she says that she did have a little bit of something like a touch of something <laughs> but she never really paid it it never phased her she never paid attention to it she just persevered um you know all of these things that make her unique actually amplified her amazing artistic abilities and um, she was really able to shine after she left the pratt institute because she just could not follow that structure and she had uh, the call of the wild for her um, she wanted to uh, travel and and in order to travel and to make money and to take care of herself, she joined a theater group. This was the absolute best um, opportunity that presented to her. And she says to me that um, as an adult, so as a child, her days in Jamaica were her favorite, but as an adult, um, from that moment, like 21, 22, 23, when she was traveling with the um, the theater, um, those were the happiest moments of her life where she was at the peak of her game, she says, like I was liked by everyone for my uh, eccentric personality and I could do anything and, and, and create anything and I had everything that I needed and I didn't need more and this was really the... Um, the best moments of her life because she gave 100% of herself to the theater group. Um, her time, her money, her energy, her inspiration, her imagination, her artistry, um, when it came to costume design, set design, um, you know, creating a show in the theatrics, um, she was uh, top notch. And in social circles of that time, um, she says she was really popular. She was, this is where she was really well liked. Um, she had, she was, you know, go, go, go. She had a lot of uh, social interactions, parties and social events. And she would have these elaborate theatrical parties at her home where she would force people to wear costumes and to do plays and Shakespeare and listen to music. She really wanted to give, uh, even a, a mini show in her home when it came to dinner parties and just drinking and smoking and having fun um she did it all <laughs> she was the life of the party she had a uh very um well she's saying raspy voice like and very like loud clear voice but it had different accents because she took on a couple of English and Jamaican accents with American. So she mixed that all together, which made her so, and she knew how to go in and out of different accents to shock uh, different people. She loved shocking people, making them laugh, making them feel uncomfortable to get out and to loosen up. You know, she didn't like stuffy people. She liked people that like to have fun <laughs> and uh, oh man, it's just like I wish I could have been to that party um, but she really knew how to be a hostess and she was a very gracious hostess um, at that particular moment in time now we're going to talk a little bit about the theater group um, so historically the theater group was called the Lyceum theater group and this is the tarot card that she wanted me to pick for describing this group. This, so this is the Three of Pentacles. 
Um, so the Lyceum Theatre Group um, was quite the um, top-notch theatre group of its day uh, in America. Uh, so um, it was the uh, Lyce Lyceum Theatre Tour, Lyceum Theatre Thor <laughs> Tour, and came uh, back to London with uh, Sir Henry Ivering and Ellen Terry. And uh, they were bo both part of the Lyceum Theatre Group. So they started in America, traveled the country, and then they went back to London. And I just wanted to illustrate that once again, she loved the movement um, uh, of that time. And um, it's interesting that Ellen Terry is actually the one that nicknamed um, Pamela Coleman Smith as Pixie. Now, the reason why that she called her Pixie was because um, she had this magical, fae, fairy-like um, aura about her, but mostly she could design things um, that just seemed completely magical to her. So that was her um, friend's um, a pet name for her, uh, Pixie. And like I said, these were the best moments of her life, traveling around the country with them. And um, she actually worked with um, Bram Stroker, who was the stage manager and production assistant. Now we all know of Bram Stoker's Dracula and Pamela Coldman Smith <laughs> uh, did rub elbows um, with these famous people. Um, like I said, um, Ellen Terry and Sir Henry Iron and Bram Stoker. Um, these were uh, theatrical, artistic, imagin uh, imaginative and um, they were the uh, superstars <laughs> of their time and uh, she just really loved being in that uh, star power creative environment um, she just I, I see her very very happy to be part of that after her experience with a the theater group and producing costumes and set designs and whatnot, um, in 1901, um, Pamela established a studio in London and held a weekly open house for artists, authors, actors, and others involved in the arts. And um, Arthur Ransom, um, at that time, he was in his early 20s, described uh, one of these at-home evenings and the curious artistic circle around Pamela Coleman Smith in his 1907 um, Bohemian in London. So she had a very eclectic circle. She was, you know, what we would term sometimes maybe a, beat, a beatnik or a hippie, um, but she was basically in the artistic community in, the, in in London's time, which was eclectic. It wasn't mainstream and it, it attracted different types of um, personalities. So this is the sun and the reason why um, that she wanted me to choose this card was because her pride and joy was definitely um, her published books. And you have to understand that for a woman in her time to be published um, quite easily and quite notable, like her nor her her fame and notoriety, um, it was it was quite something. So she was very pleased, uh, very happy uh, that uh, she illustrated two books about Jamaican folk folklore um, and Nancy stories, 1809 and. Chim Chim Folk Stories from Jamaica, 1905. These books included Jamaican versions of tales involving the traditional African folk figure, um, uh, Nasi, the spider, and also continued her illustration work taking on projects for William Butler Yeast and his brother, the painter Jack Yeast. Um, she illustrated Bram Stoker's last novel, the Lair of the White Worm in 1911, and Ellen Terry's book on um, 
dietaries, ballets, russes, the Russian ballet in 1913. So she was a well-known artist, a working artist, and she was a working woman um, in her time, very independent, very prosperous, able to live quite comfortably, and these are happy moments. Um, she was an extremely hard worker, extremely hard worker, but with this, <laughs> Unfortunately, the people around her um, were starting to do this. And this is what we're going to get into into uh, the later part of her life. There are other career um, landmarks, um, but there's too, it's too much to mention. You know, she did run a magazine and she did do some other ventures. But one thing that is um, good to note in a historical aspect is in 1907, Alfred uh, Stingles uh, gave an exhibition of Smith's paintings in New York at his little galleries of the photo um, successions, also known as Gallery 291, making Smith the first painter to have a show at what had been until then a gallery devoted only to photography now in the in the early 1900s photography was the new media but you know paintings were still recognized as being the original art but he chose pamela coleman smith to be the featured artist so that is a big thing you know being a woman in her station in life she was recognized and she was um well accomplished by her peers and you can see different um, paintings of Pamela Coleman Smith, which I'm just going to uh, showcase a few of her uh, beautiful uh, paintings here. Now we're getting into this and this, which um, intuitively represents her um, introduction to the occult world. Um, so through these artistic circles, it is said that yeast introduced her to weight, um, Arthur Edward Waite of um, a Golden Dawn member. Um, and that's how she, you know, was <laughs> introduced to that circle. And the reason why I'm showing the death card and the Tempress is because this is when um, she was kind of in a alchemic transform transformational uh, point in her life. Uh, like I said, she was very um, open, very innocent, very pure. So try to imagine a talented, unique, beautiful woman with so much potential, okay? <laughs> and here comes along, uh, you know, a esoteric order uh, predominant by men however there they there was um, I believe nine or seven women initiated in the Golden Dawn and she wanted to learn some new philosophical concepts however as I'm 
asking her like what made you <laughs> like what made you go down this this road <laughs> you know and uh basically you know it's this <laughs> the two of swords and she follows blindly um into the abyss uh because of her curiosity so her esoteric um stamp or imprint is due to her curiosity it's not necessarily due to some internal spiritual seeker and um as i was chall challenging um channeling her she was saying that everyone wants me to be this uh deep uh hermetic uh, uh wisdom goddess occultist and that's not what i was and i'm just going to channel through her words um so you know this is not particularly based in historical fact this is just my interpretation so when she uh when pamela met um arthur wade smith um she was looking again for a father figure and he was very influential and he took her under his wing um and wanted to mold and teach her into his um, spiritual philosophies. And the Golden Dawn um, is based on different types of hermetic uh, ancient Egyptian and um, ceremonial magic from uh, various uh, cultural backgrounds. Um, you know, it, it, it was known as a secret society, but they were still out in the open. So the way that they functioned um, in uh, 1909, uh, like 1901 to 1909, as, as an organization, it's, it's not to say that they were a cult, but it was a cult. They had a hierarchy and a leader and um, you had to be initiated into the Golden Dawn and then you had, like Freemasonry, all of these different degrees to move up the echelon before you could learn the uh, secret teachings. And the, um, the doctrines at the lower levels were really um, based on uh, learning like Egyptian hieroglyphics, um, uh, how to read Latin, um, the uh, the Kabbalah and uh, uh, Jewish um, the, the Jewish alphabet. It was more of a scholarly thing. And then as you moved up, you got into the ceremonial magic and then to their secret teachings. Now, which doctrine they were uh, <laughs> uh, picking from is anyone's guess. Uh, my educated guess is that they were, um, uh, they had uh, scrolls or documents or translations from different sources uh, that were from the Alexandrian library. Uh, and it most likely was probably uh, Egyptian in nature, in um, Osiris, Isis, and um, Thoth, uh, especially the Emerald Tablet and uh, the, the ancient mystery teachings of Thoth. It's most likely that. However, I think there was a lot of Jewish and Kabbalistic mysticism, uh, as well as Middle Eastern philosophies mixed up in all that. But like I said, you know, the person who founded the Golden Dawn, you know, it was based on his theories. So, so Pamela really felt like she was being offered um, promises of um, esoteric knowledge and um, pretty much uh, prestige and place in the Hermetic Order. But what people don't realize is that nothing, nothing is free. <laughs> um, I don't believe Arthur Edward Waite was a bad person. I don't think he abused her. Um, but I, I, I do know from what she's told me intuitively that he did um, use her. He used and siphoned her uh, vital life force energy, her creative energy, her innocence, 
um, you know, for serving his own purpose and serving the purpose of the Golden Dawn. It's like picking someone that has a beautiful talent, intuitive ability, and just kind of like, okay, come to my group. And then they're just kind of like molding and manipulating her in that. So what she tells me about her experience with the Golden Dawn is that she really wasn't that interested in the higher echelons of occultism. Um, she wanted to, um, again, she was a very social creature. She liked um, uh, volunteering and giving to the community. So she thought it was a, um, a noble group. And it, it does say that, um, you know, there was a lot of arguments and a lot of problems within the Golden Dawn and its members and Smith moved with weight to the independent and recified right of the Golden Dawn or Holy Order of the Golden Dawn. In 1909, Wade commissioned Smith to produce a tarot deck which appealed to the world and art and the result was a unique Wade Smith tarot deck. Okay. Published by William Ryder and Son of London and it is the most popular 78 uh, card tarot deck. So with that said, <laughs> Um, what she appreciated from, from weight, she says, is that, you know, it was very interesting to learn about different cultures. And, um, when she was asked to, uh, to do the tarot, she had to learn, um, the, uh, what the key system was all about, what the philosophy was behind this, um, the minor and major arcana and uh, what each archetype, each key system, um, each divination card, what it would mean. But it was all under the directorship of Arthur Edward Waite and, um, and his modality. And he took um, from past... Uh, cartomancy decks, uh, as well as the uh, Archon Arcanic key system, and he reinvented um, the tarot in his image. And he has a lot of um, uh, Catholic um, Catholic background, like he, he was a Catholic. So we see a lot of... Um, influences of Catholicism. We see that in the Hierophant, in the Hierophant card. And we see that in the Judgment card, as well as uh, this, oops, as well as this cross here, and then the angels. So there's a lot of Catholicism and uh, religious background in these arcanic cards. In the High Priestess, um, we do see the um, images of the Golden Dawn uh, with um, a bit of the uh, Masonic Lodge uh, imagery with the, um, the white and the black pillars. Uh, so we see that here. There's a lot of uh, mysticism. So Waite directed Pamela um, as to how she was going to draw each of the tarot cards. And she um, took inspiration from looking at different um, Kabbalistic uh, writings. And this is where she studied uh, a little bit in regards to uh, mystery teachings um, and, and whatnot. So she's not really telling me that she was a student of magic. Oh, this is this is a good one. That's the lovers, which um, wait specifically made it like Adam and Eve. Again, another reference from the Bible. So, you know, she is carefree. <laughs> Uh, and this also represents the hero's journey and the different archetypes and astrological archetypes um, throughout the numeric system. So 
you know, when she was trying to, you know, write all of these, draw all of these cards, you know, he really um, gave her creative freedom, but he was always hovering over her shoulder and really wanted it to look in a specific way. So she is telling me that she could draw the way she wanted. However, it was based from his uh, perception. So you have to understand that although these cards are beautiful and they have an, an esoteric meaning, it doesn't come from the imagination of Pamela Coleman Smith. It comes from the imagination of Arthur, Arthur <laughs> Edward Waite. And people don't like that. People like to, you know, think that she is the one that, you know, is the high priestess behind all of these magical cards. And that's just not the case. She was a brilliant artist. She interpreted his vision very well. He was um, very pleased with her artistic interpretation of how he wanted to visually, because he, he wanted to visually showcase um, a, a tarot deck uh, to be used for divination uh, throughout the world. So that in itself is very innovative and Pamela did admire him on many different levels as mentor, as teacher, as father figure, and as friend. But, you know, he did uh, take advantage of her and um, so Pamela Colvin Smith received no royalties from this published tarot. Um, she was paid very little money, a flat rate, and at the time, she thought that that was okay because she really did not expect uh, this to circulate. <laughs> she did not expect uh, these cards to circulate around the world for years and years and to, to reach such height and fame. It really, at the time when it was published, she, she actually thought it would just be another type of fortune-telling parlor game because you have to understand that um, the people were not really into occult things. When you had cards, it was mostly for parlor games or to have fun with your friends and, and at parties as parlor tricks and things like that. It really wasn't, oh, I'm a psychic medium and or I'm, you, you know, like the gypsies and fortune telling and all that. It was taboo. It was not really uh, <laughs> mainstream yet. We're not at the point of the 60s of, you know, the 60s and 70s and the hippie movement really, uh, you know, brought... <laughs> Um, you know, psychedelics, spiritualism, yoga, the East, you know, brought the Eastern philosophies to the West. That's when we had the break in consciousness uh, of, of, of uh, spiritualism. So in her mid to late adulthood, uh, Pamela Coleman Smith really was the empress. Um, she was really involved with the um, women's... Um, uh, suffering uh, suffrage uh, movement and did a lot of posters um, that were uh, about feminism and equal rights and really was um, a rebel and groundbreaking in her day and she was known to be friends with Edith Craig, uh, Ellen Terry and uh, Anne Hathaway and in this picture that I'm going to show you now this is the three of them in uh, 1902. You can see Smith there. And she had a very close-knit, female-oriented circle of friends at the later part of her adulthood. And this is where a lot of people speculate the sexual orientation of Pamela Coleman Smith. And although it's private and completely irrelevant, um, you know, I was kind of bashful to ask her, you know, <laughs> what was her sexual orientation? And, she, you know, she has no uh, reservations. Um, she basically said, I, I didn't have a label. I didn't have the, she says, I didn't have the opportunities as most women have. 
had. Uh, and she, um, so this is my interpretation, uh, because there's, there's no factual evidence, but she says that she was attracted to both men and women. And if you had to label her, she would be a pansexual. So pansexual is someone that um, falls in love with the emotional feelings of the person. It doesn't matter if they're male or female. Uh, so she really enjoyed um, people that uh, resonated her, her energy frequencies, her love frequencies, and she gravitated towards that. Um, she just said, I kind of dipped my toe <laughs> in a lot of different, um, forms of passion. So we'll just leave it at that. And, um, when it comes to, you know, like, does it matter if, she, if her, um, companion, Nora Lake, that she lived with for over, uh, like, the remaining half of her life, if that was her partner, I actually feel like uh, it wasn't a romantic partner. It was kind of like two women in a situation where, um, you know, this is what I see. <laughs> she didn't have many opportunities to be in a functional, healthy relationship. Uh, the people around her were either um, mentally or emotionally unbalanced. Um, her personality and her independence and her lifestyle didn't match uh, with any type of mate. So at the time, you, you kind of gravitate towards people that have similar issues and it was a mode of survival and friendship. Um, I'm getting more friendship vibes. I could be totally wrong, but I'm getting more friendship vibes with um, Nora Lake, um, the person that she lived with. Because, <laughs> like she keeps telling me, I just didn't have any options. So, and as time progressed, her circle of, of friends and her artistic circles and everything as we're getting into, you know, the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, there weren't as many um, commissions for her artistic work. She wasn't as renowned or as popular or as famous. famous. So she really was like a shooting star, like a flash in a pan, had that hype, and then Pretty much right after she had that commission with the um, Rider Waite tarot deck, her her um, fame diminished. Now, was she still talented, able to work, willing to work? Absolutely. It's just she was a very hardworking person. She did all kinds of odd jobs, uh, service to others, um, immaculate work that we won't even know of today it's just that it just wasn't it was hard for her as a female to make money you know she wasn't like selling paintings or having galleries or touring the world anymore she was kind of you know stuck uh so she did um eventually return to london england and that's where she lived out the rest of her days so we're almost at the completion of this um, beautiful channeled messages and summary of her life. And I have the hanged man here and she wants me to tell everyone that, you know, the truth is I wasn't this um, occult high priestess. Um, at the end of her life, she did convert to Catholicism. And I asked her, why did you convert to Catholicism? And she told me, well, <laughs> she did it because she knew that her health was declining and she felt that the carefree, spirited, and different things that she did in the past that she may have regretted, she didn't want to uh, fear judgment or damnation um, from God. So in her newfound environment and circle along with Nora Lake 
she converted to Catholicism uh, because she believed that it would save her soul and um, purify her of her sins so that when she passed, she would be able to enter the gates of heaven and be part with God. And when she told me that, I thought that was very surprising. Now, again, I have no proof of this, but there is proof that she did convert to Catholicism. And the way that she was making money at the end of her life was um, uh, so for income, she established a vacation home for Catholic priests in a neighboring house. Uh, and her lifelong friend Nora Lake joined her in Cornwall and helped to run the vacation home. So she was doing kind of like a border house for um, the Catholic priest. So I think she converted to Catholicism for economic and um, stature in her community that she needed, as well as she had a, a, a change of heart in her belief systems. And this is the demystifying aspect of Pamela Coleman Smith, that because um, her name and her legacy is tied to the writer Wade Smith tarot deck, and it is a form of occult science, doesn't mean that Pamela herself um, uh, was the forefront leader and promoter of that particular form of spirituality. Um, she definitely had a spirituality about her, but it's just not in that esoteric occult science um, way, especially through the teachings of the Golden Dawn. She did not, <laughs> she laughs, she's like, I, I did not believe in any of that at the end of my life. She you know, totally had new forms of communication and streams of thought uh, coming down towards her. Um, she wasn't part of that esoteric world. And, you know, she really wanted me to, to say that because she's like, I'm very happy that people love my art and love the um, tarot deck and that it brings joy and um, divinity uh, to millions of people. Um, she's happy to be part of that aspect of human consciousness and evolution. However, she does not consider herself a mystic or a wise woman or high priestess or occultist and anything associated with magic. She's extremely um, selfless, pious in nature, different, different archetype at the end of her, her life than how she was uh, in her uh, 20s and 30s and 40s. So after several years of financial difficulty, Smith left um, oh, some places and stuff and she was unable to find publishers for her work and um, it was following the First World War in the 1940s and you know things were just getting tougher and tougher. And they say that um, Pamela Coleman Smith died in her apartment at the Ben Cullen House in Bude on the 18th of September of 1951. Her possessions were auctioned off to pay her debts. And the location of her gravesite is unknown, but it is likely that she was buried in an unmarked grave at St. Michael's Cemetery in Bude. So this actually made me very sad um, and I really wanted to ask her why there was um, such a poverty stricken and lack of abundance at the end of her life. And although she doesn't blame anyone, it's a little bit, um, you know, fate <laughs> and the way the world works. and. Um, she just was um, taken advantage of, siphoned, uh, used, uh, used up. And she really didn't have a mindset to have financial structure and discipline to take care of herself financially. Uh, although she was independent, she didn't have a mind for that. She was, like I said, uh, 
you know, autistic on the spectrum, very spontaneous, very aloof, very, um, like we, like we see here, <laughs> I have to show it. She definitely lived the fool's life, <laughs> uh, all stages. And, um, you know, that's just the results. It's not because she didn't do good deeds or she didn't have the talent. It's just, she didn't know how to market herself, how to establish these organizations for financial success to be abundance. And because she never got married and never had children, there was really no one to take care of her. So she really relied on the um, kindness of her social circle. And like I said, with Nora Lake, um, being uh, the same kind of woman, independent, not wanting to rely on the institution of marriage for um, material success, they leaned on each other to try to survive in a male-dominated world. And then at the time, the, um, you know, a world war. Uh, so, it's, it's in, you know, the first world war, it, it was, it was very dramatic times and she is said to have passed away from heart disease um, and when I tune into her death it's just um, you know she just didn't have any more vital life force or passion and so it was all like in the heart again she's very water very emotion everything that she experienced in her life was through her heart so of course she would pass because of a failed organ, which is the heart. And I got almost into tears when I was asking her, why, why does she have an unmarked grave? There are different reasons for having an unmarked grave. Uh, most of the time it's because people are, um, you know, they, they're like nuns and very uh, selfless and they don't want any recognition like they don't matter in life you know it, it doesn't matter like my passing doesn't matter uh, it, it could have a little bit to do with financial reasons um, but I think she had enough connections uh, because she still knew of relatives and I said, like, you could have had at least some form of marked grave, but uh, there was a, a very heavy sadness when she passed. And she literally felt like a wind, uh, like a leaf in the wind. And who would notice the leaf blowing in the wind anyways when she passed? So she didn't really um, care. Like, she thought that she didn't have much purpose so that's why she had an unmarked grave people might think it's because she didn't have enough money but there was enough finances to put something she just was doing it out of um, a feeling of uh, I don't need to be recognized you know I lived I died and that's it no one needs to worry about me anymore which uh you know is really sad because you know at the very least you know there were still uh members of her extended family that recognized her that could have recognized her or honored her her both her parents had marked graves and i think it, it would have been a good memorial for her to continue um, that legacy, but it just wasn't done. I'm a little surprised that Nora Lake did not see to that. And I'm not 100% sure why that was the way it was. And uh, it's an interesting dynamic, those two. Um, there's a lot more <laughs> to be uncovered about their relationship, but I will leave that to your imagination or your intuition of um, their true um, physical and spiritual bond as soulmates, as companions, as partners. So um, Pamela really would like people to 
detach themselves from distraction and the commotions and the worries of the world and really try to tune in to artistic um, vibes, imagination, your fantasies, your imagination, and really try to connect to um, divine heavenly realms heavenly realms of thoughts um this is actually something she thought she says she's like i was communion i was a conduit to the heavenly realms of thought that flowed through me and she really wants people to experience that so you can try to experience that by um, visualizing or meditating on a couple of her art pieces. I'm going to do a couple of videos that are going to showcase her art. Um, my, my goal and my aim is her message of um, trying to tune in to your five senses. And the best way to relate that to the modern world is like someone would try to tune into ASMR videos. Um, ASMR videos are triggers within the brains that give you tingles or uh, soothing sensations. And um, basically, you can get that with sound, by hearing sound, but you can also get that visually. And there's different mediums of that in ASMR communities on YouTube. But what I'm trying to cross over with that is that sensory... Uh, sensations and, and heightened sense of awareness is what she is encouraging people to tune back into because it's um, a natural ability that we all have so we can do that with her art we can do that with listening to pieces of music and we can do that with um, the beauty of the natural world such as nature and and water so she really wants to uh, tell everyone that um, we are all divinely beautiful um, creatures of the divine with uh, unlimited potential of uh, crea creative abilities. Uh, don't let anyone, um, you know, stop you or drag you down. Just um, be yourself, be authentic, laugh loud, um, be dramatic, uh, do what you love, follow your bliss, and don't... Uh, stop yourself from uh, experiencing uh, the divine world and she's just saying like if people just try they can taste colors if people just try they can hear music when they draw or when they write um, they can have these higher density angelic magical realms um, part of their physical uh, reality in this 3d uh, holographic matrix <laughs> and um yeah so she really does see herself in a different way in the afterlife than she did in real life um i'm just going to end this by saying that she is really surprised that there's so many women that are thinking about her and channeling her and um, really honoring her memory and there are many groups of the past that have given her a proper burial and memorial and headstone and homage uh, to that so I encourage you um, to say a prayer to Pamela Coleman Smith you know thanking her for her gifts to humanity if that resonates with you um, Again, thank you so much, Pamela, for um, allowing me to uh, tell your story and to provide a couple of um, channeled messages. And uh, thank you so much <laughs> for uh, your beautiful spirit. And it was uh, an honor and pleasure to work with you. And um, it's an, an honor and pleasure to have spoken with you all, um, dear viewers, um, about Pamela Coleman Smith the uh, infamous um, artist and illustrator of the Rider Waite um, Smith tarot deck, uh, world-renowned um, published author, costume designer, set designer, <laughs> you name it, she drew it, <laughs> Pamela Coleman Smith. 
Um, thank you so much. Many thanks. Many blessings. Mary met and Mary part and Mary meet again.